Good morning, I'm Rebecca Ganetsky. I'm one of the attending physicians in the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program at CHOP. And today I'm going to talk to you about genetic diagnostics for mitochondrial disease. So our goals for today are to talk about different diagnostic approaches to primary mitochondrial disease. We'll talk about how the approach to making that diagnosis has changed over time, ultimately arriving at the current gold standard of a genetics-based approach. We'll also talk about how we can combine the clinical presentation features, as you've just heard about, with genetics and biochemistry laboratory testing to ultimately confirm the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial disease is a real diagnostic challenge. Although mitochondrial diseases are the most common in born error of metabolism, affecting about 1 in 4,300 people, there's no common biomarker for mitochondrial disease, and there's no single genetic cause. There's over 250 known genes that cause mitochondrial disease, and even though we'll talk about a genetics gold standard approach, um, a genetic cause is right now only identified in somewhere between 50 and to 70% of patients with primary mitochondrial disease. There have been previous approaches leading up to the genomic era, um, including clinical diagnostic criteria or a muscle biopsy based gold standard approach. And each of those have their own challenges because mitochondrial dysfunction is a final common pathway to many genetic and non-genetic diseases, which can cause secondary mitochondrial dysfunction to either clinically or biochemically resemble primary mitochondrial disease, while ultimately not being a primary mitochondrial disease. The historical clinical criteria were based on clinical and biochemical features either from blood and urine, or in some cases, biochemical features from muscle or other high-energy tissue. The downsides to them were that they don't incorporate genetics, and they treat mitochondrial disease as really um, a, a uniform set of clinical presentations. And so while in the modern era, thanks to genetic testing, we've identified mitochondrial diseases that may have very distinct clinical presentations, these are not incorporated into the historical clinical criteria. Um, the historical clinical criteria that exist classify patients as either having definite mitochondrial disease, probable mitochondrial disease, possible mitochondrial disease, or unlikely mitochondrial disease. And those terms may also be challenging or difficult to understand for both clinicians and patients. So what laboratory approaches can we use um, to help improve the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease? The first approach that many people use is, in fact, metabolic testing of blood and urine. And this is neither sensitive nor specific for mitochondrial disease, but it can help increase your index of suspicion and help tell you whether or not you think someone has mitochondrial disease. And it can occasionally be phenotypically useful to subcategorize someone already into a type of mitochondrial disease. Um, the previous gold standard was measurement of mitochondrial electron transport chain function in a high energy tissue like muscle or liver. The downside to that, besides the fact that it can be nonspecific, is that it is highly invasive to get muscle or liver. Um, and ultimately, the modern gold standard is to do genetic testing. But genetic testing, especially next generation sequencing involving uh, an exome based or genome based approach, requires good phenotyping and a good a priori suspicion of whether or not you need to look at the mitochondrial disease genes in order to get good bioinformatic pipeline, which is why it's so complementary to um, first a careful clinical phenotyping, as well as some of this easy metabolic testing to help increase your index of suspicion. There's little consensus about what the best first blood and urine test is. So this is a survey done in 2013 of mitochondrial medicine physicians about what the biochemical test you should do to help increase your suspicion of mitochondrial diseases. Well, you can see that everyone agrees that lactate and organic acids are very helpful. There are other labs that are done by some physicians, but not as many. And there's kind of a, a discrepancy across the board of what the, the most popular approach is. But you can see here that overall, there's a general trend to sending lactate, organic acids, amino acids, and acyl carnitines. And what are you looking for there? Ultimately, what you're looking for is both signs that the cell is primarily relying on glycolysis, which will elevate your lactate and then other markers like alanine and proline. 
or that the cell can't make energy through the TCA cycle, which will elevate your TCA cycle intermediates, or through fatty acid oxidation, which will increase dicarboxylic acids and cause disruptions on the acylcarnitine profile, um, or that the carnitine is mostly being used. Remember, carnitine exists to help chemicals get to the mitochondria so they can be broken down. If your mitochondria is doing a bad job of breaking down those chemicals, those nutrients for energy, they'll stay stuck on that carnitine so the carnitine can be low. And then there's other markers of mitochondrial disease like 3-methylglutaconic acid that can be high. What I really want you to see here is that none of these are things that I'm saying everyone with mitochondrial disease has them. And none of these are specific to mitochondrial disease. So if you see these things that can help increase your index of suspicion, they're helpful to put in part of your phenotype, um, but they don't make or break the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. So you've done that, you've gotten a good phenotype, and now you wanna progress with molecular testing. And how do we do that? So let's first take a detour to introduce you to the mitochondrial genome. So this is the mitochondrial genome. And what I've done here is I've color coded each of the protein coding genes. So this is complex one, complex three, complex four, complex five. And immediately by looking at it, you notice a couple of things. So this is fundamentally a bacterial genome. It's circular. Lots of things are colored here. And those, remember, are the protein coding genes. So this is greater than 95% coding DNA, unlike your nuclear DNA, which is more than 95% non-coding. It's a 17,000 base pair genome. You have a variable number of copies of your mitochondrial DNA. You have about 200 to 10,000 per cell, unlike your nuclear DNA, where you have two copies per cell. Those copies can be different from each other, and this is so important to talk about, and they don't homologously recombine. So the 10,000 copies per year in your cell might not be the same as each other, and they have no way, if they disagree, of doing recombination and doing a correction. Um, there are 13 protein coding genes here, the ones that are colored, but there's also non-protein coding genes, the ones that make the tRNAs, which are the little single letters here, and the two that make the rRNAs, which are the two in purple here. And you only inherit your mitochondrial DNA from your mom. So there's no patrilineal inheritance, strict matrilineal inheritance. Remember that I said that you have lots of copies of mitochondrial DNA in each cell, and they may not be the same as each other. So here we have an oocyte that has about 100,000 mitochondrial DNA. The red ones may be disease mitochondrial DNA, and the black ones here are normal. But as the oocyte replicates, each cell type independently replicates its mitochondrial DNA during organogenesis. So just by chance alone, the same oocyte can lead to some tissue types with very high amounts of mutation, like in this example brain, um, and some with very low amounts, for, in this example liver, but this same oocyte, by chance alone, could flop and have become a person with very low mutation amount in brain and high in liver. We call that mutation amount heteroplasmy, and we talk about it as a percentage. In the same family, you may also have different amounts of heteroplasmy, even when you're starting off as that oocyte. And this happens because as the um, primordial germ cell matures into an oocyte, it goes through a bottleneck where it drops down to having only 50 copies of mitochondrial DNA before expanding back up to 100,000 copies. And like any other genetic bottleneck, that very much skews the proportion between normal and mutant mitochondrial DNA. So you can see the same primordial germ cell could become an oocyte with very high levels of heteroplasmy, which would then go on to become a person who has variable levels of heteroplasmy in different tissue types through organogenesis, but overall, they will all, on average, be higher. And that would be an offspring that has classical mitochondrial disease. You can have this oocyte that has a very low heteroplasmy. That would go on to be a normal offspring, phenotypically normal offspring. And you can also have intermediate levels. So you can have variable phenotypes from a mitochondrial DNA mutation in the same family. The pedigree looks like this. Remember, we said there's strict matrilineal inheritance. So a mom passes down empty DNA mutations to all of her kids. Boys pass down mtDNA mutations to none of their kids. And then through multiple generations, you don't see it recur, um, descending from a male ancestor.
When we first learned about mitochondrial disease, we learned about genetic mitochondrial disease through recurrent mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. And I'll name some of them here, um, MILAS, MRF, NARP, and ELHAN, each of which is caused by a point mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. So it's matrilineally inherited within families. You can see that within a family, people with lower heteroplasmy may have a different phenotype than people with higher heteroplasmy in the same family. However, ultimately what we found out is that there's extreme genetic diversity contributing to mitochondrial um, disease. So here, even just looking at the electron transport chain complexes 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, in addition to the 13 mtDNA peptides that are contributed to it, we have over 70 nuclear genes contributing proteins, and actually thousands of proteins are imported from the nucleus to the mitochondria and are critical for mitochondrial function, including all other metabolic pathways that happen in the mitochondria, import and export channels that allow nutrients and these peptides that we're talking about and other things to enter the mitochondria. The mitochondrial DNA itself needs to be replicated and needs nucleotides in order to function, and all of that is maintained by nuclear proteins. The mitochondrial DNA needs to be transcribed into the RNAs, and all of the transcription machinery is, is donated from nuclear proteins. And then the, the 13 mRNAs ultimately need to be translated, and the ribosomal proteins to, for translation, the tRNA synthetases, and everything else that contributes to translation comes from nuclear encoded genes. So ultimately, most mitochondrial disease is not due to mutations in mitochondrial DNA, due to mutations in nuclear DNA. Um, we know, as I said, of about 1,500 genes encoded by nuclear DNA that encode proteins that are ultimately transported to the mitochondria. Of these 1,500 genes, we know of a mitochondrial disease that's caused by mutations in 250 of them, which implies that we have hundreds more novel nuclear mitochondrial disorders to discover. The contribution of mtDNA and nuclear DNA to primary mitochondrial disease changes by patient population. And so patients who present in infancy with mitochondrial disease are most likely to have a nuclear DNA mutation. Whereas patients who present in adulthood with mitochondrial disease are more likely to have an mtDNA mutation than a nuclear DNA mutation. Although you do see mutations in both genomes in all age groups. So this is about probability. It's so important to emphasize the contribution of nuclear DNA to causing mitochondrial disease because it has really important implications for genetic counseling. So as we said, mtDNA point mutations and other um, changes in mtDNA are inherited matrilineally. And so empirically, if a mom is asymptomatic and has a child with an mtDNA mutation, one to 4% of her other kids will have that same mtDNA mutation. But if she is symptomatic, up to half of her kids could have mitochondrial disease. And that, that's the recurrence risk to offspring of affected females. Whereas a male with an mtDNA mutation will have no affected children. But for other types of mitochondrial disease that may be inherited in a recessive fashion, which is the most common, but also autosomal dominant or um, X-linked inheritance, the recurrence risk resembles the recurrence risk for these other forms of autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, or X-linked inheritance. So the best way to approach mitochondrial disease, because it's so highly heterogeneous, is next generation sequencing. That's because most mitochondrial disease genes are individually uncommon. There's no one gene that contributes to most disease. And although I showed you the recurrent point mutations is what we originally knew, it turns out that most mutations that we see now are private, meaning occurring only in one or a few families. 
as many as half of people with mitochondrial disease may have a novel gene. Remember we said there's somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 proteins in the mitochondria, and we only have assigned genes to 250. So there's still about 1,000 where we, we don't truly know the phenotype, and yet we want to sequence them, and we want to discover the diseases associated with those genes. The phenotypes of mitochondrial disease and people with secondary mitochondrial dysfunction are very broad, and they overlap. And so it's hard to say 100% for sure going into genetic testing that someone has mitochondrial disease. And ultimately, this adds up to exome with mtDNA sequencing being the most cost-effective way to approach the diagnosis of suspected mitochondrial disease. When you do exome plus next-generation sequencing, you end up with novel genes um, and novel mutations to cause mitochondrial disease. And what do you do with that? So the first thing is to do gene matching to identify, can I find other patients who have the same mutation? Um, but often the step after that is to do functional analysis to see, does this mutation cause the dysfunction that I think it's going to cause? Um, we'll talk about biochemistry and tissue, and then the emerging availability of biomarkers. Ultimately, as you know, novel genes may need to go to research collaborations where you either do enzyme activity or gene rescue experiments. Um, and ultimately, with the goal of publishing your research, confirming the genetic mutation in the clinical lab and releasing it to the patient. So what functional analyses can you do to work up a variant of uncertain significance or a novel disease gene? Um, that opens a question of tissue diagnosis for mitochondrial disorders. Acquiring tissue is invasive, and patients with mitochondrial disease may have anesthetic sensitivity. So you have to approach this thoughtfully, and you want to get a tissue that is an affected tissue that um, is contributing to the symptoms in your patient. You can use tissue for light and electron microscopy, as well as for enzyme activity to measure how well the mitochondrial electron transportation is working. And ultimately, remember that we said that, it's in, that mtDNA um, replicates in each organ individually, and so if you are really suspicious that someone has an mtDNA mutation and you didn't find it in blood or buccal swab, it's reasonable to go to an affected tissue to sequence the mitochondrial DNA there. The tissue diagnostics are sensitive to collection um, and the way that that's approached. And once you're doing functional testing, it can be difficult to rule out secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. And ultimately, these won't necessarily identify the specific underlying cause, the way that genetics does. So it's really complementary to genetic testing. The things that people will do with tissue is um, light microscopy. And here I'm showing you the ragged red fibers. So this is a tricholum stain um, showing mitochondria that are accumulating in the subsarcolemal space. And that represents diseased mitochondria. This is most common in patients with an mtDNA mutation. So it's most common to be seen in adults who have mitochondrial disease. It's less common to see this in children or people with nuclear um, mutations causing mitochondrial disease. Immunohistochemistry can be done to stain COX um, as complex four and SDH as complex two. Um, I showed you briefly that complex two has no contribution from mitochondrial DNA um, and primary mutations in complex two are very rare. Whereas complex four actually has the highest amount of mtDNA contribution. And so diseases that affect the maintenance of mitochondrial DNA, transcription, and translation of mitochondrial DNA um, are very likely to disrupt complex four. And so when you stain both, you can see here um, SDH is stained in blue um, and COX is stained in brown. So this is a cell that has both. And these dark blue cells like this one are cells that have just complex two, and we call those COX negative fibers. And those are fibers that have complex four dysfunction. Electron microscopy is very useful for um, indicating whether or not someone may have mitochondrial disease. You can look at the number of mitochondria, whether there's mitochondrial proliferation or depletion. You can look at cristae formation and ghost mitochondria or mitochondria that don't have cristae. Or you can see paracrystalline inclusions or concentric cristae. Um, or other abnormal shapes of cristae 
or abnormal shapes of the mitochondria themselves as indicators of possible mitochondrial disease. And then ultimately you can look at how the mitochondria function by using a high energy tissue. So this is an OxFos analysis where you add mitochondria to a chamber and measure the amount of oxygen in the chamber as a marker of oxidative phosphorylation. And as you feed the mitochondria substrate, you can see this maximal or state three rate where the mitochondria are using up that substrate and so consuming oxygen as quickly as they can. And that rate at which they consume oxygen is proportional to how well the mitochondria work. So this has about a 10 to 40% chance of establishing a diagnosis among suspected mitochondrial patients. Um, or electron transport chain enzymology, where you isolate the individual complexes of the electron transport chain, feed them their substrates, and measure the goal product. So for here, the, the substrate complex one is malate, and the goal product is a, re um, a reduced coenzyme Q. Um, you can do that on fresh frozen muscle or other tissue. The problem with this approach, which was the previous gold standard, is that um, it's based on the modified Walker criteria. So it, you would call it a diagnosis if it has less than 20% enzyme activity, or a minor diagnostic feature if it has under 30% enzyme activity. But as you can see here, the true amount of enzyme activity is really a continuous line without any clear cutoff between normal and abnormal. So although we say 20 to 30% is about where that cutoff seems to be, it's really a continuous um, amount, and that makes it hard to make a definitive diagnosis. So what I hope I've convinced you is that although muscle biopsy is the previous gold standard, tissue analysis is not independently sufficient because OxFos abnormalities are heterogeneous. It's a biochemical clue to what's going on, but genetic etiology is still unknown. But this is very useful for addressing genetic variants of uncertain significance or novel genes, and so it's really complementary with genetic testing. There are emerging biochemical tests to both try to simultaneously reduce invasive testing and improve our diagnostic certainty. One of these is glutathione. So glutathione is the main antioxidant that we have in our body. And since patients with mitochondrial disease have more oxidative stress, they have lower total glutathione and lower reduced glutathione. This level is not just diagnostic, but can also be prognostic. So here you see the redox potential of glutathione in controls in blue and in baseline mitochondrial disease patients in red, and in mitochondrial disease patients who are having a crisis in yellow. And what you can see is that the redox potential is already less abundant in patients with mitochondrial disease compared to controls, and then they lose more redox potential of glutathione when they're in crisis. So it can help you understand what's happening with your patient. An unbiased search for biomarkers identified FGF21 and GDF15 as potential biomarkers of mitochondrial disease. And as you can see here, um, what, was, what was published is that mitochondria, uh, GDF15 can be higher in patients with mitochondrial disease, and similarly, FGF21 can be higher in patients with mitochondrial disease. But ultimately, these are neither sensitive nor specific. And so you can see in this publication here that there's a broad overlap between the GDF15 levels observed in people without mitochondrial disease as well as here non-mitochondrial disease in FGF21. And that's certainly been our experience at CHOP as well. These are our GDF15 levels in patients with different types of mitochondrial disease. And this gray line here represents the normal level. And you can see that we've certainly had patients who've had normal. This is a receiver operator characteristic curve. And what I'm trying to show you here is that um, GDF15 has about the same diagnostic potential as other biomarkers like uh, the CK level or lactate, ultimately being able to char correctly characterize somewhere around two-thirds of patients. Um, it is more powerful for certain types of patients. So for instance, patients with mtDNA deletion syndromes, GDF15 is universally elevated and usually very, very highly elevated. Another potential blood marker of mitochondrial disease is the accumulation of NADH. So the mitochondria, and specifically complex one, use NADH to make NAD, ultimately to power the creation of ATP. The accumulation of NADH causes secondary metabolic signaling. And so that's, in fact, the reason for the accumulation of lactate in patients with mitochondrial disease, as elevated NADH shifts the pyruvate lactate equilibrium in favor of lactate to free back up NAD 
you, NADH and NAD are not currently measured clinically, instead measuring the ratio of pyruvate and lactate as a surrogate. But as you can see on a research basis, um, the ratio between NADH and NAD is elevated in patients with mitochondrial disease, and we're hoping to make this test clinically available soon. The other possibility is to actually measure the function of the electron transport chain in more accessible tissues like blood and skin. Um, and as you can see here, what this group is showing is that you can get similar electron transport chain activity, at least for some complexes like complex one, in muscle, liver, as well as lines immortalized from white blood cells or even from skin. And this may be a, more, a less invasive approach to evaluate um, detailed mitochondrial function. So our overall conclusions are that mitochondrial disease is highly heterogeneous with no one clinical presentation, biochemical, or genetic test that works for all patients. So a high index of suspicion is needed to really pursue a multi-pronged diagnostics that starts with a biochemical screening approach, phenotypic evaluation to ultimately provide the phenotype for an unbiased genetic test, such as exome plus mtDNA, which is the most cost-effective diagnostic approach in the current era. With research exome, cohorting, tissue validation needed to discover new genes and validate variants of uncertain significance. Um, I'd like to thank my team, including the clinical team at SHOP, as well as the clinical team in the metabolic lab, um, especially Lou Tan, who's doing test development for us in the metabolic lab, and the research biochemical diagnostic group here. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll take questions now.